Hello, everybody. Good morning, all. Um, right, 821 people in the room this morning. That is a lovely, impressive number. Uh, welcome and welcome to the second day of National Graduate Week brought to you by Career Map. So, my name is Heather Reynolds. I am an account director at Career Map and the head of National Graduate Week. Today, we are joined by the team at the ECITB. Um, we are going to be speaking to Adrian Wookie. He's the head of new entrants. Dawn Thompson, she's a senior account manager. Chin Wei, who's a civil engineer at Kent. And Connor, who's a graduate project engineer at Shell. So they'll be talking to us about the ECITB and its importance to the UK's infrastructure and its part it's going to play in achieving net zero. They'll also be discussing the graduate opportunities um, and the roles within the sector as well. So just a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, ask any questions throughout the chat box um, throughout the presentation. Um, after the presentation, we'll be asking the team um, everything that you, you've put through on the chat facility. Um, so we'll do some overarching questions if there's been a common theme or some more specifics. If you've missed anything, this session is being recorded and it will be available on demand. Give it a week or so, but it'll be on the National Graduate Week website probably week after next because we've got an awful lot to get through. Um, I think that we're ready to pretty much take it away to the team now. So I'm going to disappear. Um, I'll let the team continue with their presentation and you will see me uh, for the Q&A. Thank you very much. So good morning. It's uh, Adrian speaking here. Um, and as, as, as we've heard for the next for the next few minutes, well, certainly for the next hour, we'll be we'll be talking you uh, talking through uh, various aspects of, of the engineering construction industry. And uh, to start things off, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Dawn Thompson. Good morning, everybody. Um, as we have been introduced, my name is Dawn Thompson. I'm Senior Account Manager uh, for the ECITB within the south of England um, and uh, looking after employers and helping them skill their employees to the right standards and competences to meet the needs of the industry. Um, and if you just bear with me, I'm just going to make sure that we can, you can see the slides and we can see the slides. Um, I am hoping uh, that you can all see the slides. So um, who are we? Um, as it says on there, the Engineering Construction Industry Training Board, ECITB, to make it slightly easier to say. We are the skills and standards qualification body for developing the engineering construction workforce. What does that mean? Well, it means we're a non-departmental government body. Um, we work with central government, um, engineering construction industry companies, training providers and educational bodies to attract, develop and qualify the people that work in the engineering construction industry throughout a wide range of disciplines. So, as we've indicated, we are here to make sure that everybody has got the right skills to do the right jobs. Sound really simple. However, um, engineering construction workers have very specific and highly skilled uh, needs. Um, we've got people who uh, need to use drones on um, industrial sites, so we need to make sure they've got the technical skills and training in order to do that. We've got people working on offshore wind um, sites, so we need to make sure that they've got uh, the relevant skills alongside project managers, um, graduate engineers, and the range of disciplines in between that. So um, what do we actually do? I've mentioned engineering construction now a couple of times already, but what does that mean? As it says there, we look after the UK's critical infrastructure, um, but what does that actually mean? Um, it means that without us, you wouldn't have had your breakfast this morning. You wouldn't have got the power to turn your computer on this morning. So it's very fundamental to um, the way that the world currently operates. We contribute uh, over £100 billion to UK economy and we employ 190,000 people across the sector. Um, so it's an industry we probably, you probably haven't heard of before, but we definitely um, power well above our weight. We're a very high tech industry. 
Um, and the, you know, the values there say that, you know, we make up one fifth of the total UK economy. So that's a huge um, investment into UK economy. Now, again, technically, we have a video that I'd like to play for you, um, which will give a little bit more indication about who and what we do. Engineering construction is the industry that powers our lives. It designs, builds and looks after the energy systems that keep our lights on, the machines that keep our water clean and flowing, and put food on your table. The systems that generate the fuels we use to get about and to keep us warm. Engineering construction is central to tackling climate change. Do you want to learn skills that will allow you to enjoy an exciting and rewarding career and get paid a great starting salary? The industry needs people like you to power its future. It's time to change the future. It's time to change your future. It's time for a career in engineering construction. Just pop your microphone back on, Dawn. There we go. Sorry, fail. Sorry. Um, so you've just seen a very short video um, with a little bit of background. So I now want to go through what those sectors actually mean um, and describe the infographics that you can see on the screen. Um, so the industry is made up of eight key sectors, um, oil and gas. Um, but that's not just powering uh, your cars. It's not just fuel. It is used in manufacturing materials to make smartphones, tablets, um, and it's also one of the key industries that's supporting the transition to a lower carbon future. Um, pharmaceuticals, um, I don't need to tell you how important they are at the moment, um, but pharmaceuticals is a huge industry sector within the UCI sector. Renewables, producing energy from um, Earth's natural resources, so wind, waves, biomass, energy uh, from renewables is clean, um, it is now becoming much more affordable and it is reliable. Chemicals, um, hugely diverse and impacts every aspect of our daily life. Um, 3D print market, for example, um, relies heavily on the UK chemical industry. Um, food and drink, um, now I didn't appreciate this, but it's the biggest manufacturing industry in the UK. So that's larger than automotive and aerospace combined. Um, so, you know, examples of that, Brewdog, biscuits, um, we could go on, you eat a bix this morning. Power um, is one of the one of our other sectors, power stations, turbines that generate the electricity, nuclear, providing currently about 20% of our um, country's electricity, and it is a reliable and low carbon energy source. There is a huge amount of work going on within the nu nuclear sector at the moment. But last but not least, water. Um, providing both our drinking water and wastewater services. Um, and the area that is particularly relevant to us is the sewerage treatment in and out of our houses, commercial units and industrial sectors. So I think you can see that really we are transitioning, we are helping industry, we're helping you, we're helping UK PLC um, transition into uh, the journey towards net zero. Okay, thank you, Dawn. So uh, it's uh, it's Adrian. I'm back here just to talk a little bit now about a typical project life cycle that we see in engineering construction. So Dawn's talked you through the sectors, the various sectors, and all of those sectors need plant and infrastructure um, in order to be able to produce what what they need to produce. So pharmaceuticals, chemicals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, typically, everything starts off life um, on the drawing board as a concept. So typically that will be uh, a design house. Um, so if we put it into context of, let's just say an oil rig, so uh, an asset operator owner like your Shell or your BPs could contract with uh, a contracting company that specializes in conceptual design. 
um, and they could give them a brief. They could contract with them to um, come up with a with with a design concept. And the whole purpose of the design concept is to enable um, the 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 um, asset operator, the owner, to to determine whether the concept is feasible. If it is, then we go to the next stage, and the next stage is uh, the front end engineering design, um, or commonly known in the industry as the feed stage. Now, this may be carried out by the same contractor that did the conceptual design, or it may be a different um, contractor. So, as a graduate, you could you could expect to be involved in uh, in the conceptual phase, certainly in the feed phase. So, the feed puts a little bit more detail on the concept, um, and and there's a few more. Um, Key criteria are added there, and and um, once once the feed um, the feed has been done, we then move to the detailed engineering, and this is this is where things really now start to take shape. So we're looking at what the actual, if we use the example of an oil rig, what the modules of the oil rig look like, um, you know, what the platform looks like, how they fix together, or how they operate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this this really forms the basis of, of the infrastructure now. So we then move into the procurement phase. The procurement, procurement phase is where all the bits and bobs are brought. Not only are they brought, they're sent to the various places where this oil rig is going to be built. It may be, uh, it may be built in um, offshore um, fabrication sites and then taken out to its location, wherever that may be, and, and then, um, in the construction and installation phase, everything starts to be put together. So, as you can see, the phases that we've spoken about so far, there's there's a lot of different um, disciplines involved in this. But as a graduate, you can pretty much guarantee that you'll be involved somewhere. Um, and deter, de, you know, depending on who your employer is, will will really drive what what phase or phases you're involved in. So we get to the construction and installation phase, and now we've got something that's starting to look like an oil rig in this instance. When it's put together, obviously, before we go live with it, then we need to go into the testing and commissioning. Now, this is absolutely critical um, because we need to make sure that A, the thing is safe, B, the thing operates to specification. So what typically happens is, is the, the various modules in this infrastructure um, or plant, and in this in this instance, uh, the oil rig will be tested in isolation. Then they'll be connected together and tested in blocks. Now, once everything's been tested, it's then commissioned. And commissioning is 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 the is is the the activity whereby you 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 sign it off as being fit for purpose and okay to operate. We then go into what we call the repair and maintenance phase. And the repair and maintenance phase is the phase where the plant becomes or the infrastructure becomes an operating piece of equipment. So it's producing, it's extracting, it's doing whatever it needs to do. Um, we then move into the decommissioning phase and the decommissioning phase is very important. Um, that That is when we take it to bits and remove the plant or the infrastructure when it's reached the end of its working life. So as you can see, there's, there's several phases to a typical ECI um, project and as as a grad you could be expected to work in various um, phases and and again it's all driven really um, and it's dependent upon what um, services your employer offers okay so just to recap then um, Dawn, Dawn's kind of set the scene um, for engineering construction she's explained a little bit about what engineering construction is um, it's not just a UK thing, it's global. So if you enter the, the uh, engineering construction industry, uh, you can typically expect to have the opportunity to see a lot of the world. It's a very exciting industry. Um, the employment in the industry is, is continually growing. Um, we've got some figures there now. Those figures have probably changed a little bit, but um, we're, we're looking at probably at least over well 33,000 if not more extra jobs by um 2026 now obviously with with um the, the green economy the green agenda net carbon zero etc then that is going to create a, an even bigger pull and when you when you take into account all of the new big projects that are coming on you can see that it's painting a very good and an optimistic picture um for those that wish to enter the industry and pursue a productive career. Now, once you're in the industry, it is a high-tech industry, as Dawn alluded to, and, and what that effectively means is that 
you will be expected if you're a graduate you'll be expected to undertake what we call con continual professional development um, and, and that means that you keep your skills and your knowledge um, up to date and it allows you to to remain at the top of your game now uh, Chi and Connor um, will be talking more about life as a graduate um, a little bit later on in this presentation and I'm sure they'll they'll maybe talk about um, their career paths and the importance of working towards chartership so over the next 10 years we expect that there's going to be at least an additional 700 infrastructure projects and that's that's going to be worth at least 500 billion uh, 206 billion of that will be energy projects um, so as you can see pretty pretty good picture there lots of opportunities um so i think the industry is looking good and you know personally i think it's it's probably um going to present you with a very viable and attractive opportunity in terms of careers okay so what kind of careers have we got well Dawn was talking about, you know, the fact that the, 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 the breadth, the scope of the industry activity is is varied. And, and, and really, we can kind of like split the roles a little bit and we can we can talk about graduate roles in a minute. But there's also lots of other opportunities for for site based people as well. Um, and, and everything that's built needs to be put together. Um, we use an awful lot of industrial pipe thousands and thousands of kilometers of industrial pipe in this industry now we need people to fabricate that pipe we need people to bolt that pipe together we need people to to, to test that pipe there's also a lot of mechanical electrical and instrumentation plant and equipment that 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 needs looking at welding is a very very popular and, and in demand occupation as well as metal fabrication and let's not forget the design the design teams and the project controllers and also the people that do the heavy lifting now in terms of graduate occupations there's an awful lot of graduate occupations that that um, that can be pursued and and you'll, you'll hear a little bit about that from from Connor and Chi um, in a minute but let's let's just say that you know that in, in terms of, of, of job roles the sky's the limit there's an awful lot to choose from um, so yeah I, I hope you find um, I hope you find your place in the industry if 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 that's where you're going to go. So, what I'm going to do now then is I'm going to hand over to Dawn, and Dawn's going to build a little bit upon what I've just discussed, and she's going to talk a little bit more about net zero and the importance of net zero. Lovely, thank you, Adrian. Um, so yes, as we do look ahead to net zero. Um, we know that, well, we know that many professionals are working on the superstructures um, from, as I've said earlier, wind farms to nuclear power stations. Um, and we are really working with government um, and industry to help tackle climate change by designing and installing new energy solutions. A lot of this is not new. The industry has been working um, on these themes and tackling these process challenges for many years. Um, they are always looking at um, evolving and repurposing old plants. There's a lot of problem solving that goes into working out the best that we best way that we can actually use the sites, use the plants that we've got already built um, and reimagining them to deliver um, the challenges set down by or well, set by down by people and government to uh, meet the years of uh, the year dates that we've now been uh, set across the world. Um, and, you know, by resolving and re um, looking at the power plants, it's a way that we can actually help to build a sustainable industry. Energy transition is coming. It is not, uh, it is definitely coming. It's moving at a rapid rate of knots. And it's essential that we make sure and the UK workforce has got the correct skills to hit those um, targets to make sure that we've got the skills for net zero to take advantage of the projects and initiatives. So we work with employers, training providers and government to ensure that we've got those skills um, for the future. Um, some of those, um, I, you know, some of those things are looking at um, hydrogen. Um, there's a lot of work going on across the country and Adrian will cover that shortly um, at, with regards to hydrogen. Nuclear, we've mentioned um, there are opportunities again throughout the country. Carbon capture, 
um, as well as project management capability, project control to work in a collaborative, connected way. One of the ways that actually industry has changed is um, by everybody working together um, and not doing things in silos. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a couple of minutes. And I think that's one of the biggest exciting areas that uh, for this industry is that everybody wants to drive net zero forward. And the only way that that is happening is by coming together. Um, we've taken a, a, a leading voice in that. Um, and we're, you know, one of the roles that we have is, to, as we said earlier, is to bring everybody together. So we're doing that by sitting on government task forces. We're sitting on um, UK government green jobs task force by looking at what those skills and workforce requirements are. Um, and we are driving industry and companies to make those decisions. Um, and we're looking at um, what the engineering skills are within that. And we're launching and working with uh, training providers and education establishments on a number of programs um, to drive industry forward. So I move on to Adrian to talk a little bit more about actually where those are within the UK. Um, and hopefully some of the um, some of that geography will be familiar to you. Thanks, Dawn. OK, so let's have a look at this map then. So we're, we, we've got a map of the UK here um, and um, on, on the on the right, not the text, but the green bar that, that 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 runs vertically, you'll see that we've got some symbols and those symbols relate to various um, sectors. So what we have is we have a series of industrial hotspots. Those industrial hotspots are where our heavy industry is located. So as you can see, if we start at the top um, up Peterhead, you can see that we've got um, an oil rig, we've got offshore wind, we've got CO uh, carbon capture, um, and we've also got hydrogen. Moving down to Grangemouth, which is in the central belt of Scotland, you'll see that we've got uh, downstream oil and gas. We've got a really, really big refinery at Grangemouth. So that's where the, 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 the oil that the oil and gas that's extracted is, is, is taken and refined into various types of products. Um, that could be types of fuel, oil, gas, and, and also other stuff that's used for other, other types of processes. So, the oil that goes in comes out in many, many different forms. And if we move down to, to Teesside, sort of around the Middlesbrough area, we've got another cluster. And as you can see, there's a lot of activity going on there. Um, and then we come down to uh, the Northwest um, Northwest cluster. Um, and then we come across the East Coast and we come to the Humberside cluster. And then further down the East Coast, Sizewell, that's where we're going to have a new uh, nuclear um, nuclear new bill coming on um, in the next couple of years down to Bradwell again where there's another nuclear power station we come down to Southampton and there's a big refinery at Southampton again hydrogen uh, carbon capture usage and storage and then we come around the bottom to Hinkley Point Hinkley Point is continually in the news at the moment it's probably the biggest nuclear new building in our generation um, and then we move up to South Wales and again South Wales we've got we've got um, a really big refinery there hydrogen um, carbon capture usage and storage and um, we've, we we then move up um, I think that's it. We've covered it. Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, the the point I'm going to make now is 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 that whilst we have um, focused areas of industrial activity where a lot of our companies work, that doesn't necessarily mean that's where you'll be based. Um, let me put that into context. We could sort of typically break down the the engineering construction workforce into two two groups. Uh, the first group is what we call the on-site workers, and these are the craft and technicians, craftspeople and technicians that um, are putting the stuff together, um, monitoring and operating the stuff if the infrastructures um, are normally, you know, in its normal operating life cycle, or taking it down if it's in the decommissioning phase. The other group of people um, are what we call the off-site people. Now, the off-site people. Um, typically could be where you're sat if you enter the industry as a graduate so that whilst whilst your employer uh, the contractor that you work for could be working for instance for a chemical um, asset operator owner say in Teesside you could find yourself um, working from an office in a remote location it could be in Newcastle it could be in Manchester we have an awful lot of lot of um, 
engineering houses located in the uh, in the London area. So you may not necessarily find yourself um, working actually where your contractor is uh, undertaking or providing services. So whilst we have these clusters, you can expect to either, you know, typically be based in one location or you know you could find yourself moving around you could find yourself actually working on site so there's lots and lots of breadth and depth for travel but that doesn't mean that you um you won't find yourself in a job where you're actually based in one location now um we'll we'll get a little bit more of a feel um about um, graduate life in two seconds. When I hand you over to Chi, um, Chi, uh, as as was mentioned, is a civil engineer who works with a, a an organisation called Kent. So Chi will give you a little bit of an insight into you know what it's like to be a civil engineer and how to get into the industry. And then we got Connor. Connor's a, a project engineer who works for Shell, and I think we all know that Shell are you know one of the big um, asset operator owners in oil and gas. Right. So. What I'm going to do now then is I'm going to hand over to Connor and Chi uh, and Connor and Chi are going to put a bit of a real life spin on this now uh, in terms of, you know, how they found how they found um, their, their role to date and, and how they found their way into their role. OK, Connor and Chi, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. I'll kick off, Chi, if that's OK. Yes. Um, morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Thanks for joining. Um, really informative talk so far and I think uh, Adrian and Don covered it really well. Um, like they said, I'll cover a bit about sort of my background, how I got into the industry. So my current role is a project engineer. <coughs> so essentially as a project engineer, I have um, various scopes of work within a project and I have to look after the budget, the planning, the scheduling, the resources that we have on it, the personnel and pretty much every aspect you can think of to do with the project that might be relevant, I've got a part to play in it. Um, it's very fitting that Adrian used an oil rig as an example earlier, because that's essentially my job. My role just now is we're building an oil rig for the North Sea. It's actually a floating rig or an FPSO to be exact, a floating production storage and offloading vessel. Um, and again, Adrian talked about the sort of project life cycle earlier we're very much in the construction and ins installation phase just now moving sharply into testing and commissioning at the start of next year um my educational background is i studied chemical engineering and i think the reason i did that was because i had absolutely no idea what i wanted to do when i went to university and i kind of appreciated the range of options there was um after i'd graduated as someone with a degree in chemical engineering Whilst I was at uni, I did a couple of placements. I worked in a manufacturing environment, um, sort of in, a, in the aviation sector, and I also worked for a drilling company. And it was through these I really decided that I wanted to be in the engineering and construction industry, and more specifically in the oil and gas sector. And when I graduated, I was lucky enough to be offered this opportunity with Shell. I think what was interesting about this sort of part of the story is that I'd actually applied to be a drilling engineer with Shell and they'd come back to me after interviewing and said that they felt my skill set would be more suited to a project engineering role. Um, I didn't really know what to do at that point, so I trusted them and I took it and luckily I'm here today and I'm really enjoying myself. Some of the key challenges I faced when I was looking for roles was that it was quite difficult to get information on a specific area of a company. Um, it's quite easy to get high level overview. It's quite easy to look at recent articles in the news. Um, but it wasn't great to find out exactly what operations were in a specific area of of a team or of a, a sector within a company. Um, another challenge was that it was quite difficult to often work out what a role actually entailed, you know looking at what I was applying for, it was a drilling engineer, or it was a project engineer, it was a process engineer. And, you know, they give very high level descriptions. And I guess they have to because they fit their graduates in all corners of the company. But yeah, trying to work out what you were actually going to be doing was difficult. And that wasn't easy for someone that me that didn't fully understand exactly what they wanted to do. Um, but hey, oh, here I am. I find my role very interesting. It's very dynamic and I'm on a massive learning curve. I spend the majority of my time in the office or has been for the past year or so the virtual office. But I also get to visit manufacturing sites and spend a lot of time offshore on rigs and vessels, which is very interesting. Um, 
that's where I learn the most is when I get on site and get to see the real life things happening. It's very much a balance of on the job learning, having to cover a number of competencies to make sure I'm up to the standard of a project engineer that the company requires, um, balanced with a lot of formal learning in courses. And sometimes I feel like I'm back at university, which is a refreshing change from working sometimes. Um, I think a very positive thing I found is that everyone at my work is willing to help me. They don't they don't think I ask stupid questions and sometimes I feel like I'm asking really stupid obvious questions but everyone's more than happy to share their knowledge and give me a hand even when they're stressed out their box and can't do anything um, but the thing they're focusing on they'll say look give me an hour and I'll get back to you and they always do and I really appreciate that. Um, Again, as Adrian mentioned, CPD is key. That's a really important part of my job. I'm working towards chartership through the ICME and through the APM, which is the, one of the project management bodies. Um, and that really keeps me sharp and improving all the way through what I do. I um, can safely say I really enjoy my job. It is challenging at times. There's a lot going on, but I like to learn and I like what I'm doing. So really appreciate being there. Um, wish you all the best feel free to fire any questions i'll try and have a go and i'll uh, pass over to chi to talk about her experience now hello everyone so i'm chi um background wise um i had an education in the university of warwick and graduated with a civil engineering degree and then i moved on to graduate with a master's in project management in oil and gas when i knew that i wanted to be in the oil and gas industry I currently work as a civil engineer, or you could say a structural engineer for the offshore structures team in Kent. Kent was formerly known as the Atkins oil and gas business. So it's now parted ways, but um, essentially that's what I do. Now, in terms of um, what I enjoy doing, um, on a day-to-day -day basis. We work on installation phases of a life cycle, we work on maintaining and the decommissioning phase, which makes it just really dynamic, um, which is why I enjoy it so much. I think prior to, well, when I was in university, I was so confused as to what my modules would actually entail in the real world in terms of industry. I did a lot of research um, and still I found myself um, faced with barriers because I still didn't understand how a module in steel or a module in statics would actually kind of reflect in real life and how I could use it daily as much as I loved them. Um, and so to my surprise, I ended up first being in um, the building sector in Derby, um, designing these lintels for houses. And I realized that I wanted something even more dynamic. I wanted to see things on water as time went on. I wanted to see bigger structures, bigger oil rigs, FPSOs, as, as Connor pointed out. Um, and I just thought that there were so many things happening on the offshore world, dealing with waves and loads of cool things and storms, um, which I thought was just so kind of fun would be really fun to do it would be very hands-on with the opportunity to travel which I found now I feel as though in terms of what would have helped me futuristically really in terms of the barriers is a conversation between um, real industry experts and graduates at the time I could see that there were so many different fields to go into after an engineering degree, and it was somewhat overwhelming. I mean, do I become a process engineer? Do I become a structural engineer or a civil engineer? Um, and so, yes, I found that being on a graduate program as well enables you to move through different disciplines and to speak to your hiring managers and speak to people in different positions. I found that with Atkins, I'm, it's a very beautiful dynamic where people are able to continually learn and speak to those that are in higher positions so whether that be principal engineers or senior engineers and they're able to tell you what it's like to kind of process and progress in, from a graduate level to perhaps a senior level whether you, you want to go into a more technical field or you're more inclined to be a project managerial in, in more project managerial roles so I found working in the industry incredible especially whilst doing my chartership, I found that I've been able to look at different attributes and uncover those, whether that be technical and practical application of engineering or independent judgment. You identify the limits in your personal knowledge and you're able to speak to people that, are, that have had that experience quite candidly and they're there to support you throughout the entire journey. I think what's also amazing is the 
as I mentioned earlier, the ability to travel and also meet other cultures as well and understand their practice codes in engineering. That's been fundamental in my learning. Um, also being able to practically implement design solutions and just contribute my own evaluation on a daily basis is something that I felt very encouraged by. It's really rewarding to look at the end of your project life cycle and be like, wow, I designed that and it's working and it's not failing, um, which has been incredible. I've also gained a commercial ability. And I think as engineers, that's so important, being prepared to look at bids and look at the oil crisis at times and be like, this is where we stand and this is how we need to control our budget and our bids. Um, and that kind of sound knowledge in terms of commercial arrangements has really given me a greater appreciation for the entire life cycle, not just the phases that I'm dealing with, which is why oil and gas and offshore wind that I work in has been so exciting for me. Um, in terms of kind of, I'd say, advice futuristically, I would say um, you would benefit from asking questions, asking us questions here now, asking why it's worthwhile to um, go into a particular career tra trajectory. Can I bounce off of this type of engineering construction and go into a completely different phase of engineering construction as well? As a grad, you will always be supported. Um, I think also being with the Innovate team has enabled me to see that there are so many different fields and they, they too have seen themselves supported and their knowledge has grown. Um, so yes, I think, I know that's a long-winded way of saying that the experience as a grad has been positive, but it truly has been. Being in um, the engineering world has seen, has helped me see that there is a huge power in everything we're doing. Everything that everyone does on a daily basis, we, we contribute to that. We contribute to um, the processing of oil. We contribute to, you know, seeing your mug on the table being made. We contribute to everything. And knowing that we've contributed to society in this way um, makes me feel just rewarded and privileged on a daily basis. Um, so yes, that's me in a nutshell. Anything to add, Connor? <laughs> no, I think we're all good. I'm looking forward to getting to the questions. I see a few really good ones in there. <laughs> Well, I, I, was, I, I was just I was just going to conclude if uh, that was all right before we launch into questions. Um, thank you both. I think that's just been um, really, really, really good background and insight. Um, and you couldn't have helped Adrian and I sell um, uh, the engineering construction anymore. Um, you've described everything that I would have said um, and more. I think the opportunity for the variety of roles. Um, experiences, learning, camaraderie, support. I like the fact that you both mentioned that. I think that's absolutely key in engineering construction. I've now been involved for 14 years and I would say hands down. I think that's one of the biggest things I've found. I've worked in an, a number of different sectors, but I say within this sector, um, there is support all the way from the beginning um, to the end. And, you know, as Chi has just said, we actually contribute to the world. We absolutely, whatever we do, um, has contribution to everybody's life. So thank you both. Um, thank you to everybody that's joined us today, um, this morning. Um, do use QR codes and social media tags on the screen that you can see if you want to engage with us further. I'm hoping there are questions. Um, and I will now hand over and um, let's hopefully that we can answer them. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. So what I'll do, um, I'll just pose the question to Connor and, and Chin right now, um, because I think it's a nice segue. Um, I'll, I've got three or four specifically aimed at you. So I'll start with, um, at what point in your life did you consider engineering as a path for you to take? Should I go first or Connor? <laughs> When you go to. Um, so I realised that I had a really good affinity um, in A-levels towards physics, um, maths and design. So I'm quite artistic. In my evenings, I actually am a portraiture artist. And I realised that I really, really liked just implementing the two. So it was either architecture or engineering. And what kind of drew me towards engineering 
which sounds really, really <laughs> funny, is going to Legoland <laughs> and looking at the rides and the structures. And I just wanted to understand why things were falling and why things were breaking and how things are moving at that speed. Um, I know it's so typical to say going to Legoland would make you want to become an engineer, but it was really exciting to see things constructed out of Lego and parts. Um, for me, the structure side of things is really interesting and understanding why things move, why things stay in a certain position, why things break and, and different mechanisms in which they break as well um, under different environments. So I think that was kind of, I wanted to know more. I wanted to understand why these things were failing and how they came up with all these pretty structures all over the world. Um, so yes, that was me. Brilliant. Connor? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, I mean, in reflection, it was probably very early on. I was sort of brought up on a farm in a family of mechanics. So I had an interest from a very young age, you know, yeah. Uh, Lego is a good analogy. I used to love Lego as a kid and Kinex and anything that I could build. Um, I guess when I got to school, I, yeah, I had the natural ability at maths. I really enjoyed it as well. I liked physics and chemistry and I kind of predicted that was the route I was going to go down. And as I said earlier, I, I chose chemical engineering because of the range of industries. You probably could have touched any of the industries that Adrian said earlier with that degree. Um, and the more I progressed through university, the more I focused that, yeah, I want to I want to be building things. I want to be involved in that side of things. I want to be making useful things that helps people. So yeah. in reflection very early on, but I guess sort of oblivious to myself or specific to myself, it was towards the end of university. Yeah. OK, brilliant. Um, and Chin, this is more aimed at you. What does it feel like to be a female in the sector? Wow. Um, so in the offshore structures team um, in London, Atkins, <laughs> it's very, there are few women. I will I will say that. But I don't feel as though I, I see myself presented with any barriers because I do see women that are leaders within my discipline. So there are times I think perhaps being in Derby, my first job, um, whereby I was the only woman on the team, it felt um, it felt as though <laughs> It was just slightly challenging because um, especially when commu communicating with builders on site, they would rather speak to perhaps a male who has had more hands-on experience dealing with lintels, etc. But when you go into kind of pure consultancy, I've not really found consult. Yeah, I've not really found myself um, in any situations where the, I am presented with barriers. I feel as though I'm given more opportunities actually to speak about gender diversity, especially as an I'm as I'm an EDNI champion as well within our business. I see that the the industry is changing a lot, the oil and gas industry especially, and we do have more women that are process engineers, more women that are structural engineers or project managers, and so you are able to communicate with them and and say, well, can you be my mentor? How did you um, get up to this level? I mean, did you, did you face any potential barriers? Because right now, seemingly so, I'm not facing barriers. I feel as though I've progressed quite quickly in my firm already. Um, and it's nice to be encouraged seeing senior leaders that are females. Yeah. Um, you can speak to them. There's a great dynamic in typically rather than an R engineering firm, it's fantastic. They're able to contribute knowledge to you and tell you, um, just treat your job as you, <laughs> regardless of your gender, work as hard as you possibly can. Um, show your talent and your skill set, and that will lead the way for you. That will path your success. Brilliant. Um, that's a brilliant answer. Um, okay, so another one aimed at um, you guys here. Since leaving university, what do you think you have both improved on the most within your career and skill set? I'll take this one first, Chi. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I think sort of, yeah, the softer skills. I think. I mean, you learn a lot at university. You learn the technical side of things and you go on to build on that. I'm not in a strictly technical role, so maybe Chi will have a different opinion to me on that. But personally, <laughs> personally I think it's, it's the ability to speak to people. It's the ability to to have a conversation about real life topics, whether that's work, whether that's outside of work, whether it's gender diversity. Um, yeah, I think, and I think that comes from confidence as well, building my confidence. And I mean, I was a nervous wreck when I started. I started with my work virtually, so I didn't meet anyone for a good six months. Um, 
so yeah, I really had to to work on that side of things. And then as part of that, the more you come good with people, the more you sort of form into, I'm certainly not a leader by any shape in my current role, but you do develop leadership qualities and you can start leading small groups of people um, within work and, and taking on challenges. And yeah, again, that comes from confidence. I would say that's the biggest thing I've, I've improved since I started. Brilliant. So could you just repeat the question more kind of specifically? So I, 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 I missed yeah. it getting lost in Connor's words. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fabulous answer. So um, exactly. <laughs> so since graduation, um, what do you think you have improved on the most mm -hmm. um, within your role or within? Okay. Staff? Yep. Okay. No, that's clear. Um, I would say my judgment in terms of responsibility. Um, it's just been fantastic watching myself improve and I feel as though yes I feel like just my judgment in terms of the my port styling my ability to answer questions my ability to approach principal engineers in a conversation with confidence it's been fantastic really um, since graduating I'd say prior to this role in a Dutch firm I found that I moved exponentially quickly and I was intimidated by everybody, like Connor said. Everyone was scary, but actually everyone turned out not to be scary because I was able to communicate with them. Um, and my knowledge grew. And because my knowledge grew, it meant that I got less red marks on my reports, <laughs> more happy smiles from my clients um, asking for more, for more jobs and more bids. Um, and so I was able to implement and construct design solutions with confidence later. Um, at first, it's not easy. I mean, working first time out after graduating. As I remember my um, senior engineer telling me, you literally write like you're writing a dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> you're sending off a dissertation to a client, practically. And um, I remember him basically just writing off a, lo a load of pages. And I felt so intimidated by that. But actually, now looking back, I'm like, actually, we need to cater to the needs of our client. We need to cater to the needs of the world. And that kind of transformed my thinking. And I think that's transforming my thinking every single day as an engineer. I feel more prepared to answer problems. I feel as though my industry jargon has improved on a daily basis. You mm -hmm. ask questions, you Google, and you move forward and you manage risks and you manage safety in a practical environment too. So yeah, that's my answer. Wonderful answer. Okay. So um, if, I've got quite a lot of more generic questions now, more about working in the sector and employers and so on. So um, what are the starting salaries and what is the earning potential working within the sector? Connor? Or... Yeah, I can have a go. I think, uh, yeah, it's a good question. I think it's an impossible one to answer. Um, I, it's very it's very sector dependent it's very area dependent obviously if you're living in london it's going to be slightly higher to sort of work with the costs um i couldn't give you a, an exact answer off the top of my head shall to be I, honest shall i try connor on you go don if you can give them a number because i was just <laughs> going to tell them to google it because i think that's what i did <laughs> Well, they can Google it. Glassdoor has some very helpful answers. However, um, on average, you know, the salaries are higher in the engineering construction industry than a number of other industries. Um, and as graduates, you are, um, yeah, your starting salaries are higher. What do I mean by that? I would say um, upper 20s minimum. Some companies will offer early 30s minimum as graduate entry. Um, and you can expect, well, hopefully expect um, to have relatively re um, relatively rapid rises up. But that is down to you as individuals as well. A number of companies will um, reward you for achieving chartership. Um, and a number of companies have set um, salary paths based on um, the graduate programs and, and how you achieve those and whether you you know, reach your uh, KPIs and deliverables. So a simple answer, mid to late 20s onwards. Um, it, is a, it is a good opportunity. It is good salaries within this sector. Um, if you get the opportunity to go overseas, you will get um, overseas allowances. Um, and um, yeah, you can certainly um, aim for, aim for um, a good realistic salary throughout your career. Brilliant. 
Dawn, I think I could just ask you two more questions that you have um, touched on, um, if I can just keep you a moment. So somebody asked, um, in the way of COVID, how, has, um, how have overseas opportunities been affected with travel restrictions and so on? Um, yeah, how has that changed? Um, okay, I can't answer succinctly um, or specifically, but I can give some vague understanding of companies that you know I've spoken to and maybe Connor um, and Jean, we can actually give some specifics. Obviously, COVID has impacted the ability for people to leave this country or people to come into this country, you know, just just as just as much. Um, but I would say that travel is now starting again, depending on um, the countries they're going to. Projects have absolutely not stopped. They've all had to work ha work out how they can deliver against project timescales. They may have been delayed, but they haven't stopped. Um, but travel is definitely starting. You know, I know people that are now back on planes um, and back at site. Um, if they were at site when COVID started, they've obviously had to work out when they've been able to return, how they've returned. Companies have had to give some flexibility to that. Um, other companies and other countries have put other stringent rules in. It, again, it's very difficult to be specific, but COVID hasn't stopped projects. Um, it might have delayed and slowed down travel, but travel has started again and travel will continue to start. I would say travel is going to be less, but travel absolutely needs to and will continue to happen in this industry. Brilliant. Um, uh, Dawn, I'll just ask you this from Jason. He says, um, do the ECITB help grads get jobs? Um, is there a dedicated service for this at all? So um, no, is no, we, we don't. We can signpost you to companies that are taking on graduates um, and we know which companies are within um, our remit of companies being in scope. So we can absolutely signpost you in those general directions. We can signpost you to others um, like Shell and the operators that tend to have graduates on an annual basis. We can direct you like that, but we don't have a specific portal where companies come on and um, register their, their vacancies. Okay, brilliant. Um, Seb asked a question for Connor and um, Chinway, which is, do you use any virtual reality or 3D printing? And if so, can you give examples of how, please? Have you got an itchy? Okay, I'll go. Um, so yes, several times. Um, when I worked in as a placement student in a manufacturing site, they used to 3D print um, you know, they used to they used to spray long tubes and pipes, and they used to three D print caps that would go in the end because I had to be specific for each one. So they used to take a, a scan of sort of the end of the pipe and three D print that and just put it in, and it had to be specific, it had to be fast, and that was the most efficient way to do it. And as I was leaving, they were buying another three D printer. Can't tell you what that was for because I've got no idea, but uh, yeah, definitely a lot of potential there. In my current work, I have seen three D pr printed models of subsurface. Sort of geological structures that kind of show you it gives a good example of sort of what the, the subsurface looks like they have different colors for different layers and uh yeah it just kind of shows us where the oil is which is i guess at the end of the day the most important thing to us so yeah lots of examples of 3d printers more than i can explain but uh, yeah really, <laughs> really great technology going forward brilliant um, okay, this was a question from Jack, and it was more around the offshore um, element of the work, or some of the work, and he asked whether the work is considered dangerous. Do you want me to pick up on that and then maybe maybe hand over to Connor? Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, obviously this is, as an industry, it's a high-tech industry, and the environment that you work in um, is high hazard. Um, th there's no getting away from that. Now, obviously, it depends what your job role is. If 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 you're you know if you're working from a remote office, it's going to be less hazardous than if you're actually out on the infrastructure. But um, what is absolutely key um, in this industry, wherever you're working, is behaviours. Um, there are really high expectations in terms of behaviours and standards, and safety is an absolute 
absolutely critical factor um and it's 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 interwoven with everything you do everything you learn is all focused on safety and it becomes second nature um obviously when you're out and about on the infrastructure or the plant maybe connor can give us a little bit of real life context in a second in terms of what it's like on an oil rig but wherever you are if you're on a petrochemical facility or a pharmaceutical plant or a nuclear power station then you're 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 in and around processes that emit you know hazardous substances heavy machinery simultaneous activities going on at once lifting fitting you've just got to be got to be on your toes but like i said it's second nature um you know be, behavioral safety is absolutely key connor connor i've i've kind of <clears throat> touched on it maybe you could give a little bit of a real life example of how you found it and, and maybe Chi could add something as well. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, great. Um, great sort of overview there, Adrian. I think, uh, it c can the work be considered dangerous? I think in short, yes. But what I think there is, is a lot of mitigating measures in place. So for example, before I went offshore, it was a really intensive week's training. Um, I did sort of my helicopter rescue side of things, which is sort of worst case scenario, you'd think, but uh, talked to you a lot about the safety on the rig, um, whether that's a boat, whether that's a fixed installation. Um, so yeah, I was really prepped for going off. And then when I got off, you know, they were lifting things that were, I don't know what weight they were, but would have, you know, one drop and it would have killed someone instantly. Um, and probably done a lot of damage to the boat we were on. So there was so much process and procedures in place that minimized the risk as much as possible. Um, I felt safe when I was off, there was so much in place. And as a learner, people showed me the ropes, they could sort of, just took my hand and walked me through it so yeah i felt safe but if your behavior is not in the right place and you're not in the right mindset it could definitely be dangerous gosh good good answer though thank you um right then we've got four minutes to go i've got a couple more questions that i think we can rattle through um i'm not sure who's going to take this one um what are the costs of continued pressure um, continued professional development I think um, I'll, I'll start and then I'll, I'll maybe hand over to Dawn and then maybe we'll hand over to our to, to, to Chi and Connor. But I think it just depends what you're doing. Um, it, 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 it's essential. There's no getting away, away from that. Um, and, you know, that, that, that the costs would vary dependent upon your pathway. The Professional Engineering Institute that you're working um working with in terms of cpd dawn in terms of putting a quantum on that an exact cost i, I think that's very difficult to do and um in some instances that, that cost wouldn't be borne by the individual would it no that's exactly right adrian that's what i was going to go on to say that most of the time certainly as a a new entrant coming in um most companies will support you with um those costs <coughs> most will um, I say most because obviously there are always exceptions and we don't want to be caught up on that. But most companies will su um, support you by um, paying your um, annual costs. And I think actually that is um, you can have that deducted from your tax bill as well. Um, costs of training um, are often met by the employer and subsequently um, by ourselves as you get to chartership status. Um, you know, those in, those costs will come down to the individual, but a lot of the time companies will help you support that because it's there. They need you to be um, skilled and trained and having the competences and being chartered in order for them to deliver projects. So a lot of the times the companies will actually help. So don't be put off by costs on um, on the Institute websites um, because they are often supported. That's really helpful. Um, right then, guys, time has absolutely flown by and we've got through practically all of the questions. So I'd like to say a massive thank you to all of the team here. It's been so helpful. Um, I will just hand over to you just for the next 30 seconds or so, just so you can finish off with any kind of <clears throat> uh, words, words to leave the audience with. There's still over 725 people with us, which is amazing. Um, what an audience to have and what a morning. But um, I'll just hand over to you before we say our final goodbyes. Just for me, um, in terms of, of summarising, I'd, I'd summarise the industry in, in just a couple of words. 
exciting, innovative, demanding. So if if you want a, a boring, mundane job, maybe this isn't the industry for you. If you want a job that's going to present you with daily challenges but keep you stimulated and give you lots of opportunity and adventure, then this is the industry for you. Dawn, I don't know if you want to add anything just to close the session down, or Connor or Chi. I think, Adrian, you've summed it up. Um, I think we could talk around those words, but um, I've been in the industry 14 years and I don't think a day has ever been the same. And I've had a variety of roles um, in this industry. It's If you want to drive the world, this is the industry to join. Wonderful. Right then, everybody, thank you for attending. Our lovely audience here, thank you for all of your questions. Thank you to the team. Thanks for a brilliant presentation. I've been Heather. I'm from the <coughs> Graduate Week, and we will see you again soon. Thank you, everybody.